On December 16, 1985, a couple of hunters came across the remains of an unidentified female at a dead end on Den County Roads 59 and 90 in Pearland, Texas, just south of Houston. The remains were found on land that is now part of the Silver Lake subdivision. The victim's manner of death was ruled a homicide as the result of a gunshot wound. However, they were unable to determine the victim's identity, which would remain the case for 36 long years. The body was found in a pasture about 50 yards from the road's intersection. At the time, she was believed to be a Hispanic teen between the ages of 15 and 25 years old. Investigators recovered a small red sweater, a pair of blue jeans, and a woman's wristwatch, which had a square face and a maroon leather strap. It was determined that she had died 6 to 12 months before being discovered. The area where she was found is about 20 miles west of an area known as the Texas Killing Fields, where the bodies of no less then 30 missing and murdered women and girls have been found since the 1970s. In October of 2022, Brazoria County investigators announced that Jane Doe's real identity was that of missing 16-year-old Alicia Marie Cooks, who went by Lisa. Lisa was born on January 16, 1969, and had been reported missing in the Houston area by her family in the summer of 1985. Before her identification, her family provided DNA, which was added to the NamUs database. This, along with the help of her brother, Byron Parker, is how her identification was finally made. At this time, investigators do not believe she is related to the other victims found in and around the Texas killing fields. As of March 2023, they are still trying to determine who took Lisa's life all those years ago. On May 24, 1985, a school teacher driving to work found a woman unconscious in a ditch along Highway 91 near Colquitt Ford Road in Baker County, Georgia. She was rushed to Phoebe Putney Hospital in nearby Albany, Georgia, where she was treated for severe head trauma and abrasions on her face, arms, and back. The woman had apparently slid about 60 feet on the rough roadway. It was likely that she had either fallen or was pushed from a moving vehicle, though investigators could not rule out the possibility that she was the victim of a hit and run. There was also no evidence that the woman had been beaten or sexually assaulted. When she was found, she had no identification and was given the name Baker County Jane Doe. When found, she was wearing a gray t-shirt, faded blue jeans, and white kids tennis shoes. A laundry tag on her jeans bore the name Allison Miles, but they were still unable to identify her. A dingy pillow was also discovered in the ditch about 20 yards away from where the woman was found, but investigators could not be certain it was connected to her in any way. Sadly, Baker County Jane Doe would succumb to her injuries eight days later on June 1, 1985. Investigators had taken a photo of her in the hospital before she died and distributed it to the media along with several sketches. Several people would come forward to inquire whether she was their missing loved one, but no one was able to identify her. The community cared for her grave and hoped one day to finally find her family. Meanwhile, her loved ones were searching for her, but the connection wasn't made because she was located five hours from home. 27 years later, on September 21, 2012, her body was exhumed to collect a bone fragment sample. The bone fragment was sent to a lab for isotope analysis, which examines the bones and teeth of an individual to see where they consumed their water for the past 8 to 10 years before death. However, no leads developed from the test. The test actually indicated 12 different states where the Jane Doe may have lived and reportedly excluded the state that she actually lived in. In March 2022, a comprehensive DNA profile 
was created by Othram Labs using the bone fragment collected 10 years earlier. A genetic genealogist was able to determine that the unidentified victim was Mary Anga Cowan, a mother of four who went by the name Angie. Angie lived in Seminole County, Florida with her four children, 300 miles from where she was found. Until she was found, her children assumed she had just up and abandoned them. Her son Daniel, who was seven years old at the time of his mother's disappearance, said he saw her car outside the home and assumed she would be returning soon. Angie was born on December 13, 1956, to parents Elizabeth and Davis Hammett in Gary, Indiana. At some point, the family moved to Florida. She was the second youngest of six children and the only daughter, and her oldest brother David had died in Vietnam in 1966. Angie married twice and had two daughters with her first husband, Peter Hall, and two sons with Carl Cowan, her second husband. Angie's case was the first time in the country that the federal government funded the cost of the test. The circumstances of how she ended up critically injured on the side of a Georgia highway remain unknown. While Angie has been identified, as of March 2023, her case remains open and unsolved. On October 24, 1997, a woman's body was located in Lake Michigan, floating next to a break wall in Manistee, Michigan. She was wearing only one earring, and an autopsy determined that she had drowned a few weeks earlier. With no way to identify her, she became known as Lake Michigan Jane Doe, 1997. Then, 23 years later, in 2020, authorities began looking at her case once again. However, bone samples from the Jane Doe's remains were not deemed suitable for traditional testing due to their degraded state, so they were sent to Inner Mountain Forensics. Nearly a year later, with the help of genealogy research, the victim was identified as 26-year-old Dorothy Lynn Ricker. Dorothy lived in Chicago at the time of her disappearance. 22 days before she was found, the police received a call regarding a suspicious person off Lake Drive. When an officer arrived around 12.30 p.m., they found Dorothy sitting on a bench by the lake. It's unclear what prompted the call, but Dorothy reportedly told the officer she was on vacation and just enjoying some sunshine, and the officer didn't note anything out of the ordinary about her. Later, police discovered a vehicle abandoned near the spot where they had seen her a day or two earlier. Inside the car was the purple sweater she was wearing on the day the officer last saw her. With no obvious signs of foul play, it's suspected that she may have decided to go skinny dipping and got caught up in a current or a riptide. Dorothy was reported missing three weeks before her body was ultimately discovered. At this time, Foul play is not suspected in the case. In the desert in Mojave County, Arizona, on January 23, 1971, three hunters were walking along Hackberry Road, a dirt road about two miles east of U.S. Highway 93, when they discovered a white cotton canvas sack. The sack had a company name printed on it, Deer Pack Ames Harris Neville Company, and was tied at the top with rope. Upon opening the sack, they would find the deceased body of a female. She was dressed in a long sleeve blouse, a black long sleeve cardigan sweater, and burnt orange stretch pants. She wore a pair of black leather ankle high boots, brown leather driving gloves, and bobby socks. She had no jewelry on her body or identification and would remain unidentified for the next 25 years. It was determined that the Jane Doe was between the ages of 35 and 40 years old. The sheriff's office put out an artist's drawing of the victim, but no credible leads were generated. Finally, years later, the sheriff's office's special investigation unit reached out to the Museum of Northern Arizona 
to sketch what the victim might have looked like based on the features of her skull. Still, no one could identify her, and she became known as Mojave Jane Doe. The Jane Doe had a long scar on her stomach, possibly from a C-section, and a bone indentation found on her ring finger meant that the woman was likely married. Her nails were meticulously manicured, and she was not a smoker. Early in the investigation, her fingerprints were sent to the FBI, and a report of her expensive dental work was distributed in prominent dental magazines. Those records were checked against thousands of patient files, but still, no identification could be made. Her death was ruled a homicide, and some reports state that she was strangled to death, while other reports say the coroner found no signs of blunt force trauma or gunshot wounds and ruled her cause of death as unknown. Her file and DNA sat in the sheriff's office for decades until investigator Lori Miller pulled it out in the summer of 2020 determined to finally solve the mystery of the county's oldest unidentified victim. In October 2021, the Mojave County Sheriff's Office partnered with Othram and contributed $1,000 and asked the public to fund the remaining $6,500. In order to collect the money, a crowdfunding post was made on the DNA Solves Facebook page, and they were able to reach their goal in just five days. Once Othram's test was complete, they sent the details off to a genetic genealogist. For the remainder of 2021, Miller worked with the genealogist and searched through family trees, eventually finding a strong potential match in Ohio by the name of Colleen Audrey Rice. A DNA test was then sent to a relative of Rice. That relative provided investigators with a yearbook photo of Rice, and it resembled the sketch drawn over 50 years ago. On January 23, 2023, on the 52nd anniversary of her discovery, the Mojave County Sheriff's Office announced that Jane Doe was officially identified as 40-year-old Colleen Audrey Rice, who grew up in Portsmouth, Ohio. Colleen was born in Portsmouth on March 17, 1931, to parents James and Flossie Truitt. She went to Portsmouth High School, and the only photo available of her was taken from her high school yearbook. She would end up marrying William Davis at the age of only 14 or 15, and it's unknown if Colleen ever had any children. It has been difficult to piece her life together since she lost contact with her family after graduating from high school. As of March 2023, investigators are still trying to determine the details behind her death. On December 10, 1988, local residents gathered for a community cleanup event held alongside Bayside Drive in Atlantic Highlands. During the cleanup, something caught the eye of one of the volunteers. At first, he thought it was a plastic ball, but once he got a closer look, it turned out to be a skull. After authorities were notified and began searching more of the area, they found almost 85% of the skeletal remains. It was later determined to be that of a white female between the ages of 15 and 18 years old. The area she was found in was described as a wooded hillside off Lower Bayside Drive, leading to a Sandy Hook Bay beach, which later became the Henry Hudson Bike Trail. A botanist reviewed the scene and the tattered clothes found on the remains and estimated that the body had been there for about 15 years. This would put the year of her death between 1973 and 1975. She was wearing platform sandal shoes, knee-high white acrylic socks, a gray and red nylon long-sleeved lace top, and a white bra. In 1992, with the assistance of the FBI, a clay reconstruction was made over the skull and showed what she might have looked like. In 1997, several parts of the skeletal remains were sent to LabCorp in North Carolina for mitochondrial DNA profiling. Meanwhile, she became known as Monmouth County Jane Doe, and it would take 33 years to determine her identity. In 2020, authorities reached out to Bode Technology, who were able to create a DNA profile. The profile was then given to a genetic genealogist. 
the genealogy research led them to a distant relative in Georgia and eventually to a surviving sister of the Jane Doe who was living in Pennsylvania. Her name was Kathleen, and she volunteered to provide her DNA. It was finally announced on December 5, 2022, that Jane Doe was actually 16-year-old Nancy Carol Fitzgerald, who had gone missing on April 2, 1972, 16 years before she was found. When she vanished, Nancy was living with her family on Mower Avenue in Bloomfield, New Jersey. Nancy's sister, who was 15 at the time of her disappearance, traveled cross-country searching for her sister after she went missing. About a year after Nancy vanished, her mother got a phone call from a girl begging and screaming for help. Finally, she cried out, Mom, I made a big mistake. Come get me. Come get me help. And then the phone went dead. Her mother believes the caller on the phone was her daughter, Nancy. Before this, they had received numerous calls from an unknown person. When they answered the phone, they would hear breathing on the other line, and when they'd asked if it was Nancy, the caller would hang up. Nancy grew up in Bloomfield in Essex County, New Jersey. After her father died in 1968, she and her family moved from Crown Street to Mower Avenue in Bloomfield. She attended North Junior High School, which is now Bloomfield Middle School. She began hanging around a bad crowd and started skipping school, experimenting with drugs, and hanging around older men. In 1971, Nancy overdosed on barbiturates and was taken to a hospital by the police. When they returned her home, the police searched Nancy's bedroom that she shared with Kathleen, looking for drugs. They eventually found more barbiturates that Nancy was supposed to be selling. On April 3, 1972, The day after Easter Sunday, she was last seen having dinner with her family, 50 miles from where she would be found 16 years later. It's still unclear how and why Nancy died. Some still believe she could have been a victim of serial killer Richard Zarensky, who murdered 17-year-old Rosemary Colandriello and received life imprisonment for the crime. He was also recently linked by DNA to the murder of 18-year-old Mary Agnes Klinsky. He is also the suspect in the deaths of several other young females from the 1960s and 1970s. In 2008, Richard Sarinsky would die from pulmonary fibrosis while in the Southwoods State Prison in Bridgeton, New Jersey. As of March 2023, Nancy's death remains unsolved.